If you've been paying attention to this YouTube channel, you know that I love Swift Playground. I've basically put my game development on hold while I take some time to explore this application in detail. I wanna know what it might mean for other people like myself who are more hobby developers and you know doing this as more of a learning experience than a professional thing. So I've spent the last several weeks learning Swift UI and experimenting with what Swift Playgrounds brings to the table. Fundamentally, there's a lot of good here. And honestly, that's the point of this whole video. I want to bring attention to Swift Playgrounds as a platform for people who are just starting out. But there are a few things that I hope Apple will address in upcoming updates and this is my list of complaints. Let's dive in. So there needs to be a better way for source control in Swift Playgrounds. If you want to branch off and do something else or experiment with your code in ways that may impact the source code, you need to have that protection. You need to be able to, right now there really isn't really good ways to do this. Apple has the potential here to create a, a Swift Playgrounds source control, which would be more of an introduction to source control because if you really step back and think about it, Swift Playgrounds is targeted to people just learning to code or maybe tinkerers or hobby or hobbyists like me that don't need to have the full-fledged source control that you get with Xcode but rather just a little bit, just a taste. And I think Apple could create that within Swift Playgrounds. And that would go a long way to help teach people who are using Swift Playgrounds in the classroom setting to teach code. You wanna be able to teach these concepts, but they don't need to be overly complex when, when people are learning them especially at introduction levels, which is where I see Swift Playgrounds really taking off in the education side of things. Uh, one thing that's really confusing to me in Swift Playgrounds is how it handles images when you import them into your app. In Xcode, you have the ability to uh, import you know, your image and assign it a 2x or a 3x size. And then when the app is run, it will determine which size goes to which device. In Swift Playgrounds, you just import import an image and I guess it dynamically resizes the image as it needs for the device. I'm not really sure, I haven't dug into this. I guess I understand why Apple implemented it this way and that's really just uh, to keep it simple. And coming from Xcode, it's a bit confusing, but if Swift Playgrounds is your first introduction into coding, then adding an image from your you know, files or photos and dragging that into Swift Playgrounds is probably the easiest way to do this. Right. So one of the big promises Apple made on stage when they introduced this was the ability to work cross-platform with your project. So you can build your, your app on your iPad and then work on it on your Mac when you're by your computer. And yes, you can share through iCloud. I've demonstrated this in previous videos and work on your app in Xcode on your Mac. However, it's in a Swift Playgrounds package. It's not an Xcode project file. It's a Swift Playgrounds file and that is limited. It doesn't have all the functionality that a Xcode project package has and that will limit what you can do on your Mac, even when you're on your Mac. Apple needs to figure this out and give us more power when we want it. And when we don't need it, it's just a simple project in Playgrounds app on our iPad. When it comes to being able to release an app, that's great. You can release an app to the App Store. You can even release a paid app to the App Store. But what Swift Playgrounds for some reason limits you from doing or restricts you from doing is you cannot have in-app purchases within a Swift Playgrounds app. And I think this is a big miss on Apple's part because as we know, free apps are the vast majority of apps on the App Store. The way that these apps are monetized are through in-app purchases. So without being able to put in-app purchases into your app, you're really limiting the ability for these people that are releasing apps with iPads, presumably because they are on a very, very tight budget, um, being able to monetize their app. You know, if you're on a very tight budget, it means you're not gonna have any money for marketing spend. In order to get people to download a paid app, you need to be able to spend money on marketing. 
that's kind of the list of cons that I have so far. Let me know in the comments below if you've come up with any other things that, that you've found that Swift Playgrounds can't do. And um, yeah, we'll see if, if, uh, if Apple addresses any of these in upcoming updates. I'm sure they are going to keep building Swift Playgrounds. It's already on its fourth generation and I'm sure there's gonna be a fifth, a sixth, and continuing on. So with that, I do think there, that Swift Playgrounds is fantastic. It is super fast, lightning fast on my 2018 iPad Pro, and it is even fast and usable on my older iPad fifth generation, which came out years ago. I think they're on like seven or eighth generation now. Um, maybe even, maybe even more than that. I, I don't know, but the base iPad is $329, three and 299 on an education discount. And you can easily find used iPads secondhand for less than that. And then you get um, a cheap wireless keyboard and you are able to get up and running and coding for easily less than $200. Yes, I can see the potential here and I am a big fan of Swift Playgrounds. It needs a little bit of work and there may even one day be a full-fledged Xcode on the iPad in the future and that would be fantastic. Until then, here's another great video for you to watch. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.